Today I'd like to talk about, about blue, the color that rises from the profoundness of the Mediterranean Sea, the color whose cerulean gray surprises us with every morning sky. Today I would like to talk about the charming turquoise of somebody's eyes, the Persian blue of a sapphire, the calm cobalt blue of Lugano Lake. Whenever I think about blue, I visualize something I like, something I'm attracted to, something which is made of the same matter of beauty. At the very same time, throughout history, most cultures have associated blue with a sense of anxiety, of melancholy, of an existential torment. The Egyptians, for instance, used Nile blue to depict the afterlife, certainly not the most reassuring place to be. Picasso picked it and picked Asia for its blue period. 19th century African-American workers picked blue to label blues, a very gloomy musical style. You probably all know what feeling blue means and may recall the sense of apprehension you perceived when contemplating Van Gogh's Prussian blue sky of the starry night. Look at it, what a heart-breaking grace. This is what I like so much about blue, its tension and ambiguity. It's a powerful metaphor for something we're attracted to, but it gives us pain at the same time. Life often forces us to deal with what I call blue choices, meaning incredibly complex decisions where what we crave is inevitably linked with pain and suffering. But let me give you some examples. Think about a father and a husband who falls in love with another woman. He desires to spend time with his new love, but leaving a family behind will cause suffering with his beloved and eventually to him as well. What should he do? Staying with his family or leaving? This is what I call a blue choice. Another example, think about a person who's considering to stop an antidepressant therapy out of the desire to perceive the world for what it is authentically, not for how a molecule makes it more digestible to him. Together with the appetite for that genuine perception of the world comes the fear of not being able to face it, of suffering again. What should he do? Continue medication or stop the medication? Last example. Think about a teenager who's considering to come out and reorganize his life based on his true sexual preferences. What if that comes at the cost of compromising relationship with a mother or a father or close friends? What if that happens in a country where it's even forbidden or in a society that just doesn't accept it? Coming out or not? Blue choice. Um, I faced the blue choice myself uh, during my career. When I graduated, I was so fascinated by the social media industry and I dreamed of working for the social media industry. At the time, companies like MySpace, Second Life, Friendster, High Five were redefining the way we interact with each other and I was so charmed by those seeds of the digital revolution. A few years after graduating, I was working for eBay as the marketing lead of nine European countries. I was working with the smartest people on earth, with a very big team, an international role, the marketing budget that every chief marketing officer dreams and also the freedom to spend it, a permanent good contract. It was basically the dream that every professional has. Then one day, Twitter called me asking me to join their team and cover for their Italian marketing manager who was about to go on maternity leave. Just to give you some context, that was the time when people were first becoming aware of the role that Twitter had in the Arab Spring. Can you imagine how excited I was? That was my golden ticket for the social media industry, finally. And that was in a period where the company who was offering a job to me, you know, was relevant, was bringing change. Still, I know if I um, decided to change, I should have left an international role for a local one, a very big team for a team of one, a permanent contract for a maternity leave coverage, which is a contract that lasts a maximum of one year, and, you know, all the perks and the benefit of being on a fast-growing company, because on that time, Twitter had yet completed another big round of layoffs. Staying or leaving? 
that was my blue choice. And I like um, a Kierkegaard sentence where he said, to be means to be able to choose, because it is exactly blue choices that define our most intimate self and our identity. Now, in that situation, as many of you may do as well, I took a piece of paper, I wrote a big plus on one side, a big minus on the other, and I started to think it over. You can imagine the pluses being a vital part of a company who was redefining the way we participate in debates, we share news, we form our opinions. But the minus front was very crowded as well with things like, well, you know, the fear of not being able to do the job? After all, I was coming from online commerce, very different sector. The fear of making a step back in my career and, well, you know, the fear of being unemployed in one year time or even less and lose economic independence. It was such a tough choice. I mean, how could I weigh on the same balance the curiosity for a new job and at the same time the fear of not being able to make it? You see, a characteristic of all blue choices is that you never get the luxury of comparing apples to apples. It's apples to mosquitoes to highways to pioneers to forks all the times. And I just couldn't make my mind until a certain point, a point when I realized that the word fear appeared seven times on my minus list. And now, don't misunderstand me, fear is useful, fear is good, it's a healthy evolutionary tool that allowed our species to protect itself from very legitimate threats, fine. But what, what, what was I doing? I was just indulging my fear, I was listening to their judgments of my life. I was weighing their version of a worst-case scenario, and I didn't need that. I did not need a framework that allowed me to listen to my fear. I needed a framework that allowed me to solve a blue choice. And that's when I started to think about a two-step mechanism, which is applicable to all of you, and that helped me, and I think can help all of you as well, to face the blue choices of your lives. As an author and as a marketeer, I very strongly believe in the power of the stories we tell ourselves. In fact, step one of these methods requires a little act of imagination. Take our world, press Control C and then Control V to get to a duplicate of our planet, which is exactly this planet with one significant difference. In this new world, you are not frightened. Fear doesn't belong to your emotional universe. You do not know how fear manifests or how it feels, as fear simply doesn't enter in your mental posture. Now, once you can visualize this parallel world, ask yourself one question. How would the story of my life continue if I weren't frightened? Asking myself and thinking about that parallel world turned my blue choice into something very different. When I observed that world and that planet, I saw my not threatened self. He was very well aware he was unable to do the job. And that's when I saw him spending days and nights in reading interviews and points of views on the most controversial topics of the social media industry. That's when I saw him asking questions to industry experts and getting a mentor from the social media industry. When I saw my not threatened self on that planet, I saw he was very well aware that the move was a step back in his career. And that's the moment where I saw him, you know, better positioning his profile in the advertising industry, building better links with headhunters, spending more time in developing a stronger network. When I observed my not threatened self, I saw he was aware he needed to do more to earn economic independence. And that's when I saw him, you know, making a saving plan and working on other revenue streams, like setting up little consultancies or finishing and publishing that novel about very complex choices he always had in mind. This was a blue moment. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, you probably get my point. Asking myself, how would the story of my life continue if I weren't frightened, turned all my fears into as many tailor-made action plans I could implement right away. If you remember the balance, the pluses stayed the same, while the minuses turned into actions. The whole idea of a balance became obsolete, leaving the way to a packed agenda of things to do. 
still I have to make a confession. When it was time to sign that resignation letter and leave permanent contract for a maternity leave coverage, the bigger salary for the lower salary, the international role for the local role, the big team for the small team, I mean, that was damn hard. Because truth is that in life, it's never enough to know what's the right thing to do. You also need to find the bravery to actually do it. And that's when step two of my methodology comes into action. But let me first make a small step back. Stanley Rachman proved that courage can be learned. He studied bravery and fear among, um, in the British Army, and more specifically among those soldiers in charge of neutralizing weapons and unexploded bombs, the most dangerous and scary job you can imagine. He discovered that soldiers were able to cultivate a great capacity for courage, even if they initially lacked the ability to persist under pressure, or if they initially lacked a good level of self-confidence. More specifically, he found that the ability to function well in face of great danger was largely the result of two things, training combined with the execution of other dangerous missions. In other words, the more military bomb disposal officers successfully completed other dangerous missions, the less they were subject to fear on their next mission. Bravery can be learned. Now, you know, we live in a society that romanticizes courage in the midst of extraordinary adventures. We see courage as something which is necessary only for few major life-changing events in our lives. But I invite you instead to see courage as something that can be learned and that can belong to your daily routine, just like having breakfast, reading the news, listening to some good music. And that's why, after building the habit of confronting your not frightened self, there's a second step I invite you to embrace. Do every day one thing that scares you. Yes, do every day one thing that scares you. Just like the military bomb disposal officers get used to confronting fear, little by little, only once a day. By getting used to doing one scary thing a day, you can build that basis and that stock of courage that can allow you to face a blue choice exactly like your not frightened self would have. And, you know, if a day doesn't gift you with anything that scares you enough, pick something you can always do. For instance, I confess I'm afraid of the dark, so whenever life doesn't gift me with anything that allows me to build that incremental centimeter of courage, I just try to get asleep in complete darkness. So let me end this brief, brief talk in a slightly different way. And let me tell you one thing. Kandinsky was deeply charmed about blue. And he was used to say that if you want to show the color blue to a blind person, you should make him hear the sound of a cello. We live in a controversial planet, an Olympic pale blue dot which throbs in dark space. A land made by a mysterious mix of unbelievable beauty and incredible suffering. We make choices every day, sometimes even every hour, but our tomorrow depends on a small subset of those decisions. Those that look more controversial, divisive, contestable, equivocal, tough. Those whose color ranges from celestial blue to navy blue. It's exactly blue choices that define our most intimate self, who we are and what characterizes our lives on this planet. Cicero said, if you wish to persuade me, you must think my thoughts, speak my words, and feel my feelings. Your not frightened self is the best person who can persuade you, as his thoughts, feelings, and words are closest to yours. Whenever confronting a blue choice, ask yourself, how would the story of my life continue if, if I just weren't frightened? And then, to be ready to act. Do every day one thing that scares you. My wish for all of you is that blue choice after blue choice, you won't be able to distinguish anymore which world was copied and which world was pasted, which self is frightened and which self is not. 
my wish for all of you is that the decisions of your life can be taken based on what you desire, linked with your sense of integrity, justice, empathy, compassion. My wish for all of you is that you can replace fear linked to a blue choice with a curiosity for the future you open. My wish for all of you is that your life can be a testament, a testament to your hopes and not to your fears. Grazie.